Amen. So, um, first of all, thank you to Devin for filling in last week. Wonderful. It's so good to hear um, that um, the folks are really appreciating a message by him. And uh, it's, it's wonderful when I go on vacation, so I know that you've got uh, a good voice in the pulpit to help. And uh, that's wonderful. This week, we're continuing on and understanding how we can enjoy God, which is something we don't normally talk about. And the theme for this morning from the passage that we've already read is living loved. It's not as easy as it sounds. Because when you understand how you live loved, it means a whole lot of deconstruction and reconstruction. There's a whole lot of things that we pick up in our lives. A lot of ideas, a lot of beliefs. Some of them we pick up from church. Some of them we pick up from scripture. Some of them we pick up from uh, Christian examples. But there's a lot of ideas and there's a lot of cultural things that filter into our lives to help us figure out what is normal and what is socially acceptable. And, and we have this mix in us. Not, some of it's not so necessarily right or wrong. Some of it just is. But it's important for us to filter through and to look back and to understand there is a dynamic difference in the Christian faith as opposed to living any other way by any other society or any other culture in this world. I want to talk a little bit to start off with how cultures shape us. And I want, to keep, I want you to keep in the back of your mind the passage of Scripture we've read earlier because we're going to be coming back to that very quickly. But this is what typically happens in, in cultures that we find ourselves in. Typically, cultures shape us. And in culture shaping us, most of us have a hard time dealing with things that are out of place. How many of you would be what they would call obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, or have, have, have touches of it? Okay, obsessive compulsive disorder means that things have to be organized in a specific place, in a specific way. The unique thing is that you can have two people with obsessive compulsive disorders, but their obsessive compulsiveness is different. So some of them would have to arrange their cereals alphabetically, but others would have to arrange them based upon the color of the boxes. So um, don't have them work at a grocery store. Anyway, <laughs> but we all have a touch of this. We all have a, a way of, of pegging things. We all want to put things into certain little pigeonholes. And that's kind of how we deal with all the data and all the information that comes at us in life. Did you realize that? So for example, if you meet somebody... Um, what are some of the first questions you ask? Oh, uh, where do you live? Right? Uh, what do you do? That's another question we ask. Um, you may ask whether or not they go to church. You may ask whether or not they're a student. There's all these different questions that we ask. And do you know what we're actually doing? We're, trying, we're creating a profile for them. You would never say that, but you're creating a profile, a file in your brain, and you're going, okay, I know they come from here. I know they do this for work. I know that this is one of their activities. Oh, I've got a pretty good idea what they're like now, right? Oh, they're from Charlotte County, and they haven't finished high school yet. Oh, I know what they're like, right? Whoa, we do this subconsciously. We don't even think about it. It just is something that we do. Our cultures also do that, and, and we pick that up from different ways people interact with us. And one of the things that we see in our cultures is that we sort and profile people and things based upon events or uh, based upon comparisons, right? Maybe we will look at a, maybe we'll go to a graduation and we will make an assessment based on the, the student that has received all of the sports scholarships. Or we'll make an assessment based on someone whether or not they have the gold um, uh, cord around their neck, whether or not they're an honor student or not. And with that, we tie in all kinds of different values. Oh, this person has this and this and this. They're important. Oh, this person doesn't have this and this and this. They're not as important. You see, and, and it happens. It happens a lot in our society and in our culture. And then we go through things, um, whether it's officially recognized or unofficially recognized, we go through things in our cultures like rites of passage. 
Now, if you grew up in a culture that was primarily focused on um, survival, uh, maybe you would be in a culture where you were taught at a young age how to fish or how to hunt, and then in some of the uh, First Nations cultures, some uh, Aboriginal cultures, there would be a time where a, a child is prepared and then they are tested. They are sent off. They go and they, they, go and they are able to go on their own hunt. Or um, Boy Scouts, any Boy Scouts or Girl Guides? Okay, so remember you have to go on your camping expedition or you have to go on whatever the case is to, in order to earn your badge and prove that you are able to X, Y, or Z. Might be one or two military folk here that have gone through basic training. Might be, that's just, just an assumption. There's all these things that you have to go through and then afterwards you are deemed to have been approved and to have passed and then there is an accolade or a, a celebration or an achievement afterwards. As simple as high school graduation. They've made it, they've made it through those years of schooling and now there is a reward and there's a party and everyone celebrates. Almost every culture has something like this where they are saying, okay, you have met this criteria and now we can either enter into a greater level of trust with you or we can enter into a greater celebration with you. I've spent a lot of time talking about this, but here's why I did this. When we read through this passage of Scripture, I want you to see something that is completely standing on its head. Jesus is baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. Jesus approaches John the Baptist and asks him if he would be baptized. John says, no, I'm not worthy to do this. I should be baptized by you. Jesus reinforces and says, no, this is something that you need to do, and I need to do it in order that we do things right so that it, things will be accomplished appropriately. Basically, Jesus is setting the example for baptism so that the baptism we had today is something that Jesus himself was baptized about 2,000 years ago kind of exciting when you think about that. But here's the thing that happens. After he was baptized, this is what we see. It says, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Notice this. He was beloved before the testing. You got that? Before Jesus went off into the trials and into the temptations and into the desert, before Jesus went there, he was already declared by the Father as beloved and well-pleased. Know this. God's love for you and pleasure in you pre-exists any trial or test. That defines unconditional. I'm an only child, um, but I do have a lot of cousins. My dad has 10 brothers and sisters, and they all decided to have kids, and they're having kids. And so there's a lot of cousins that exist. And so one of my uh, cousins has just had a uh, granddaughter, and her picture's all up on Facebook, and Odessa is beautiful. And listening to the commentary of my cousin and my cousin's son, the dad of this little girl, they love little Odessa. They, like, love little Odessa. Any of you ever have a baby that's been born into your family and you just are struck by love for that child? Any of you? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. But here's the thing. Little Odessa can't feed herself. <laughs> little Odessa can't dress herself. Little Odessa needs a diaper changed. <laughs> right? Little Odessa can't even sit up. But she's loved. Well, that's not fair. You shouldn't love her. She's supposed to be able to do things for you to love her. Right? Isn't she? She's supposed to be. She should be accomplishing. If she's not accomplishing, why can they, how can they be pleased with her? How can they love her? What has she done? What has she done to deserve this love? Anyone answer that? She was born. Her parents just love her. Got it? 
Think about this. Why does God love you? He just does. That is the definition of unconditional love. He doesn't love you because you can sit up straight. He doesn't love you because you could do this task or that task. He doesn't love you because you have gone through this rite of passage and now you are appropriate. He doesn't love you because he looked and scanned across all the babies in the, in the unit and went, oh, this one's the pretty one. I love that one. Oh, this one's the tall one. I love that one. Oh, this one cries a lot. I don't love that one. How foolish it sounds when we talk about that, right? But we have to remember the Father's love. It pre-exists trials and temptations. It is the definition of unconditional. Because love empowers. If love hangs in the balance of any test, there is stress. Right? If we think we could lose someone's love, then we are under extreme pressure. And we live with the question, what if? What if? What if I don't do well on this, you know, challenge? What if I can't do this? What if I can't do that? Then they won't love me anymore. And then we believe this foolish lie, which is failure equals unloved, which equals rejection. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Failure equals unloved equals rejection. That's what we think. And when we pick that up in our culture, we read the scriptures through that lens. We read through the lens and we see the prodigal son going, yeah, he was a failure. Yeah, he, he did and he wasted it and it's awful. And there's no way the father could love him because look at what he's done. That's not true. It's not true. Failure does not equal being unloved, and it does not equal rejection. We sometimes take that on, but it's not true. It is not true. I, I read this quote this week, and, and I'm definitely quoting the man who, who wrote it with Steve Lawson. And here's what he says. Salvation is not a reward for the righteous, but it's a gift to the guilty. If you think you're doing enough good stuff in order to have earned your salvation, wrong. Salvation, entering into God's love, entering into God's presence, it is a gift to the guilty. It's a huge difference between opening and receiving a gift than earning your wages. Ephesians 2.9 goes and talks about that some. It's important to know this. And it is crucial. It is the foundational thing. If there's nothing else that you pick up from this morning, think on this. God loves you, period. And that, when that becomes the foundation, when that becomes the, okay, here is a foundational truth, then everything else can build upon it properly. Because being loved makes one stronger against temptation. I'm going to go on a little fishing expedition over here, okay? So promise not to take too long. But there's a TED Talk out on, on, uh, on the YouTube. You can watch it sometime. And it's a man, he says, everything we understand about addiction is wrong. Some of you have seen that. Actually, a couple of people have forwarded it to me, and I thought it's a really powerful thing. A lot of people think that the opposite of addiction, of addiction is sobriety, Right? So they're no longer using this substance, and now they're sober because they've avoided using that substance, and something has led to that. Well, the truth is, is what we understand about addiction happens from actually what some scientists did back quite a few decades ago. Some scientists took a, a, a rat, placed him in a, um, a cage, and gave them two choices. He had water, and water laced with a drug. And the rat... Um, they found over and over and over again, eventually uh, drank the water that was laced with the drug to the point that it would overdose and die. And they repeated this experiment over and over again. And 100% of the time, the rat that was exposed to the water or the water with the drug went to the water with the drug and, and overdosed. But uh, later, some scientists said, well, let's, still, let's use rats again, but let's try something different. Instead of just putting the rat in the cage alone, 
with those two options. Let's put the rats in with some other rats. And let's put the rats in with some tunnels. And let's put the rats in with some balls and some different things so they could be quote unquote social and so that they could connect. And they did this again. And do you know what they found? They found that the rats liked the regular water, not the drug-laced water. And if they ever did use the drug-laced water, they only used it briefly. And they never overdosed and none died. Now we're talking about rats, we're not talking about people, and I, I got that, and so I'm not trying to be a psychologist or psychiatrist with you, I'm seeking to be a person that breaks open the word of God for you, but I want you to see this, is that even in creation, even in the creation that God has made, in, in, even in the animal realms of what God has made, he's showing us the truth, and the truth is, is that the opposite of addiction is connection. What it means is that if you are connected, if you are feeling that you are included, I will even stretch it to the point of saying loved, that temptation loses its power. Things that are always around us and can always pull us away have less power when we are connected, when we are feeling loved. I, I don't think I'm going out on a stretch to say this. If you feel unloved, if you feel like nobody understands you, if you feel like you're all alone, then my guess is you will make far more destructive choices than if you're feeling loved and safe and secure and connected. Am I correct in that? Right? I, I unfortunately do marriage counseling. I say unfortunately because I don't enjoy it because it means typically there's a crisis. And I also say I don't, um, unfortunately, because the people have to listen to me. Either way, <laughs> um, the situation is, is that many times when there is a crisis or something has happened, it almost always boils down to I didn't feel understand. They didn't know me. I felt alone. I had no other option. And they've made choices that have led to a further marring uh, of that relationship. However, when connection happens, when people are feeling loved and know that they're loved, then we see that they are far less likely to be drawn into temptation. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about this passage of Scripture, and I want you to see this. Jesus knew before he went into the desert, he was loved by God. You got that? Jesus knew. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I love this guy. I am pleased with this guy. This is one that I really cherish. And then he sent off into the trials and to the tempting. That's a whole different ballgame than saying, well, let's see how you do. I'll be waiting at the finish line if you make it. It's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? I love you. I'm pleased with you. You haven't been tested. You haven't been tried. You haven't changed your own diaper, but I still love you and I'm pleased with you. You got that? And here's what happens. Satan comes along. The tempter comes along. After a considerable time in the desert, a considerable time without food. And here's what the tempter came and said to him. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Does not sound like a difficult challenge. You haven't eaten for 40 days. You need something to eat. Turn these stones into bread. If you're the son of God, you can do that. That is a miracle you can easily perform. We see later on he turns water into wine so he could easily turn the bread and a stone into a bread. But here's what Jesus says, and I want you to, to hear how he's saying it. He said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When I read this passage over and over, and, and I've been to school a lot, and I've read that passage over and over, it's very easy to read that through and go, Sunday school answer. Very easy to read that through and go, you know, that's an appropriate answer that Jesus would say to Father God. That sounds very theologically correct. It has nothing to do with being theologically correct. It is, but that's not the reason why he said that. Here's what Jesus is saying. This. 
since I'm loved, I don't need to take care of me first. Since I'm loved, I know that God won't let me down. Since I'm loved, I wouldn't trade him for a meal. And that there are better things for me than just bread. I would rather hear from God than abandon that so I can have a quick fix and have some bread. Right? How many people have waited at an airport for a loved one and not gone to the cafeteria to get a coffee because they didn't want to miss the person coming off the plane? Right? You're willing to go hungry in order to reconnect with that one that you love, right? That is what Jesus is saying. He's just saying it in words that we take and go, oh, they're so spiritual. No, what his words are saying is like, no, I would rather hear from the one who says he loves me and he is well pleased with me and that he cares for me. That is more important than getting that meal because I know I'm loved. That's more important. The next temptation, because, you know, Satan never gives up. I hear an amen? <laughs> Satan never gives up. Never gives up. Here's the next one. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. you just, just go for it. And Jesus said this. Yeah, on the other hand... <laughs> it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, oh, that sound, that's, that's really smart, Jesus. That's really smart. Yeah, here's what he's saying. Knowing that I'm loved, knowing my identity, knowing that I'm loved, means I don't have to make God prove it. It means that I don't have to require him to intervene supernaturally. I don't need him to do something miraculous. I don't need him to work in response to some type of risky or harmful behavior. Oh God, if you love me, prove it. We don't have to have God prove it to anyone. And the truth is, if you're questioning if God loves you, it's already been proven. Remember, what more does he need to do to prove to you that he loves you? Does he need to do card tricks? Does he need to be able to keep you from um, risking this or that? Or do you need to win a lottery for God to prove to you that he loves you? Or was this enough? The next thing that we see is this. And finally, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus, one more time, said this. Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What's he saying? Knowing that I'm loved means I don't have to have fame, power, and prestige. You know what? There's a lot of people that have a lot of fame, a lot of power, a lot of prestige. They're very lonely. They don't feel loved. They believe all the people that are gathered around them are gathered around them because of what they can favor can be given to them. They don't know any authenticity in friends. There is a very high level of depression amongst people that are very uh, famous, very privileged, very powerful, very isolated. Don't need people to idolize me or treat me highly. I don't need every luxury. I have what money and fame can never gain. Jesus is basically saying to Satan who says, I can give you everything the world has to offer. So Jesus is saying, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. I'm loved. I'm loved. I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm loved by God. He will provide for me. I will serve him. It's a good thing I've got going. There's nothing you can offer me that makes it worth giving it up. And that's always what the tempter seeks to do. Give up a little bit of what God has. I'll give you something better. It's never better. It's never better. Do you know this? For God so loved, insert your name here, 
Mark, Chris, Ed, Stuart, Nancy, Marilyn, Joan, Andrew. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Yeah, well, well, Pastor, God was talking to Jesus, and, you know, Jesus, like, Jesus is Jesus. Like, come on, of course he loves Jesus. Who doesn't love Jesus? For God so loved you. He loved you so much that he sacrificed Jesus so that you could be in relationship with him. He loves you enough that he let Jesus die so that you could live. Does he really love me? You are loved. And that changes everything if you let that truth ring in. Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you that we're loved. And in knowing that, Lord, help that take root in our minds. So many things that we have believed or picked up or heard has filtered into the soil of our hearts and our minds and crowded out the truth that we are loved by you. Lord, we ask that you would take away all those untruths. Take away those beliefs that we have that our love is based upon a comparison, that our love is based upon a performance, that our love is based upon anything other than your affection for us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. We are so undeserving. And yet, in that, we can experience the fullness of life. Lord, may your love empower us to live lives that are truly transformed, that are lives that are free, and that are lives that are free to love others in the way that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.